which D? What is it and why haven't you heard about this? Um, I will give a quick introduction. I'm talking about the topic for quite a long time, actually, and then nothing materialized, actually, and we're getting closer. So what is SwitchD? An open flow implementation for OpenBSD. Um, so let me give you a short introduction, basically, to the idea. So I, some time ago, I gave a talk about VXLAN. That was uh, the VXLAN driver in OpenBSD. Um, I implemented like three years ago, maybe. It's there. I think we, we were the, the first of the BSDs having VXLAN in the, in the base system. Um, the other BSDs have other implementations, but so far VXLAN is being used. But VXLAN is kind of related to what what we're doing with this um, open flow now, and that's what I called like three years ago the cloud networking stack. So just to make it even better, I put a pony on a, on a cloud actually. <laughs> so this is also like recycled slide from three years ago, but this area was kind of empty. And it's like, okay, we, we implemented VXLAN and it's, it's widely used actually. I think last year, uh, Ray gave a talk about uh, VXLAN usage and things like that. It was very fascinating that in open source something, sometimes you write something uh, you don't really have a use case. Some, some software I write really has a use case and a need and I implement it and I share it with people. But in VXLAN it was more or less an, um, an exercise for me, an experiment. So I wrote the driver, I had a discussion with DLG, another de developer, how to do it and he did it in a different way and then this driver ended up in a tree. And then I come to a conference and I hear a talk from, from Ray how, how he was using it across the, 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 the US and all that and a pretty impressive setup. So that's sometimes a really good surprise and stories that you like to hear as a developer. Yeah? Like if you're using my stuff, tell me. That's, it's always interesting. So the new part here is the switch and switch D. Um, that will show up soon. And we have a few more virtual networking drivers, but that's also a different topic that's basically might be here. We open VC runs on, on Zen now, um, Amazon EC2, for example, and we are working on support for Hyper-V to run on Hyper-V and Azure. Um, so XNF is the Zen driver, the NetFront and the HVN is the uh, upcoming Hyper-V driver. It's, that's the right name, right? Uh, okay. So first, a disclaimer. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day or the Berlin airport is still not ready. Um, <laughs> and I'm from Germany, so that's maybe kind of a thing in our country. Um, Switch D um, haven't been released yet. So Switch, Switch D and Switch. I planned to do it for this release cycle in, in April, but then got overwhelmed by work and life. So um, it's not there yet, but I hope to share it with more people soon, but maybe not in OpenBSD 6. Maybe like we have this six month release cycle in OpenBSD and we are already slowing down because we had some very substantial changes with security, WXOX, and so on. So yeah, you might have to wait a little bit longer for the switch D show, to show up. Um, the code exists, um, and we see. I mean, we're not really using branches, so it's like a secret until we put it in our source tree. <laughs> um, and then once it is in the source tree, there will be lots of work because it's quite a complex issue. 
That's like the Berlin airport when they plan to open it. They found out all the air conditioning is not working or something like that. And so it might take another 10 years or something like that. Is that very environmentally Yeah. <laughs> Henning is from Hamburg, where they built an Oprah house, uh, which is about the same situation, right? Like, it was supposed to be opened up here at the same time as Berlin. This is the Berlin airport, and we kept having the crash. We couldn't secure it. So it's Berlin, which has two and a half times all of us, and it's like five years behind us. So the Hamburg Opera House is only two years behind, but 12 times all of us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's 2006, right? They started this, yeah. Anyway, like the B&D headquarter in Berlin as well, and still not finished. So um, we like to make it right. So the open flow protocol is the very interesting pro protocol. I stumbled over it actually the first time, um, and almost 10 years ago, when I was um, doing work and uh, partnering with HP, and then they send me, oh, can you try this, this internal testing firmware for the HP 5400 switches? It does stuff called OpenFlow and SDN, and uh, so I, I looked at it, but I didn't have time, and so I forgot about it again. It's kind of, it was kind of interesting. That was probably OpenFlow 0.1 version or something like this. <laughs> um, the fun thing is the developer who implemented uh, used to be a um, Linux wireless maintainer I worked with before. So there's some long history, but then the open flow um, format is actually it's a binary protocol that runs over TCP um, or TLS actually. And oh, there's a white space error even, but anyway. Um, which has a simple header, like the version, then the type of the, the, the packet that you see, the length, and the transaction ID. So that's nothing, nothing special. And then the header is followed by the type-specific header and whatever comes next. It can also include the complete packet dump, actually. So what is this open flow thing about? So it is a simple idea and a method. So if you, you have a, a, a switch, a, a typical networking switch, the, the traditional way was like the switch is doing everything in the switch, right? You, you have multiple ports, and then it's a learning switch. So it receives a packet. If it doesn't know the destination, it, it broadcasts it to all ports. Um, and if it gets like an answer on another port, it knows, okay, I find this destination MAC address on, on, on port four, and next time you get a packet for this MAC address, you send it out for, to port four. So a learning switch is a very simple algorithm, and then you need some um, timeouts and, and all that. Um, but modern switches do a lot more, of course. They have VLANs, they, they might even do routing, They they, they have many other things. And so internally, they differentiate between the control plane and the data plane of a switch. Um, actually, that in, in, in BSD, it would be probably a little bit like, what is the kernel doing, right? The kernel is doing the routing, the forwarding, the bridging, and then you have the, the, the BGPD making the decisions, but um, well, we also do some control stuff in the kernel, like, like the, the route lookups and, and all that. So the, the switch, basically all it really has to do is like sending packets from A to B and making the decisions in a crappy little firmware in a switch that is, I don't know, VX works based or so on, something that doesn't scale very well, especially when you have virtual machines. Um, you have a virtual switch on a server, and I don't have a whiteboard. You have a you have a virtual switch on a on a, on a, on your host. Then you have like ten different virtual machines attached to this virtual switch, and then you want to migrate a virtual machine, like this live migration feature, to a different host that it suddenly shows up on a different 
part of the network, but the machine is still running and it's supposed to be transparent. So now you somehow have to tell your network instantly, basically, that this MAC address is not found on the virtual switch on, on, on the uh, host A, it's found on the host B. So there are many methods to do it, but the whole idea is like you kind of merge the intelligence of these switches together by using a central controller that is aware of all the systems in the network, all the MAC addresses basically, and all the decisions. So with OpenFlow, a switch that supports OpenFlow can, instead of making the forward forwarding decisions itself, it can ask the, the controller with the OpenFlow protocol, here I got a packet, so it, it, it sends this open flow packet with, with the, the header I showed and the subtype. And it includes the full packet dump, actually. Sends it to the controller. And the controller is a little bit like TCP dump. It analyzes the, the packet dump, the Ethernet header, or maybe even the IP header and everything is there. And then the controller can make a decision where to send this packet. I think that's a very interesting design decision that they don't send metadata to the controller, like some descriptor that includes the Ethernet address, source destination, IP, and all that. Uh, um, it's very interesting that they just send the raw packet. And you have to pause it yourself, but you have the, the best flexibility what you do to analyze it. Yeah? You could say whenever the word hello world is included, then send it to port five or something like this. You, you can do what you want, basically. So then the controller, when it gets such a packet in, that's like the most simple primitive over the open flow protocol, that's like, okay, I have this packet, I received it on port one, um, and here's a raw packet, where should I send it? Then the controller can make a decision, and I say, I don't know, flood it to every port, or send it out to port five. That's a packet out message, the, the response from the open flow controller. That's really like open floor for dummies at the moment. I know we have some experts here. Um, and you could imagine this wouldn't really scale in the network, right? If you send every packet back and forth to the controller, that would be really horrible. Um, there are some use cases where you might want to do it if you want to send every packet to an IDS, for example, transparently. Um, some people are doing that. But, yeah, like monitoring ports are, for, are so 90. So. Um, <laughs> but you can, you can give additional instructions as well. You can say, send this packet instead to the usual port, send it to a monitoring port, or send it over a GRE or VXLAN tunnel somewhere else. Um, but then you, you, the interesting part is the flow mode. That's basically, instead of answering with a packet out, um, you, you send a flow mode, basically you insert a flow into the switch, which is kind of like a state in PF, we would say. Like, you insert this flow in the switch, and Tell it, okay, when you see a packet with, with that classification, typically the, the, the MAC address, the destination address, but the, the, the way you can match and classify the packet has been extended multiple times and it's very, very powerful feature right now. So when you see that packet, send it to the other port and then the switch is just doing that without asking the controller anymore. It's a bit like PF works, right? PF gets a new connection, evaluates all the rules, which is still kind of expensive, and and then it and people sometimes complain, "Well, wow, couldn't you optimize the rules to do something like this?" And and, and but the, the the key point is why uh, PF is fast. It it inserts a state in the kernel, and then when whenever we see a connection, we just look up the state, which is really fast, and, and forward it. In this case, uh, the, the switch would, would do the work. And once it gets like a packet it doesn't know, it asks the controller again. Um, that's a really nice thing. <laughs> so these four packets, the hello is basically the connection setup. It's designed to be a um, bi-directional asynchronous protocol. So 
one side says hello, the other one sees that, and then you can open a connection. Open flow is running over TCP, but in theory, there you can run it over UDP as well. Um, there's actually a specification to do it over DTLS, but DTLS is not so popular anymore. So, yeah, that's all you need to implement a basic open flow controller. There's four protocol types. So, when I started playing with it, there was this open flow specification 1.0, basically. That's I really liked it. It's, it's simple, easy to understand, and saying they, they, they did it right. It was a research project at uh, Stanford University, as I said, with HP and a few others. It was good. But then I quickly saw, okay, now we have version 1.1 and 1.2. That's still okay. They added missing features, like um, matching MPLS, I don't know. I'm, yeah, we have MPLS stack in OpenBSD, so it can be useful, but it's maybe not the average usage. And VLAN is useful. The TTL is quite interesting. Um, this allows you, the simple TTL trick allows you to, to build a, a router using con, uh, the um, open flow. That basically says you insert a flow into the switch and say, okay, whenever you see that packet, matching that the classifier, it can also include an IP address, then decrement the TTAL as well. That's all it needs to do. It, it knows a little bit about the EP, IP header, it decrements the TTL, and suddenly you have a router running in hardware. I, I thought that is quite interesting. We could maybe think about something. I mean, we, we don't, we, we're not doing this. Yeah. But in, in theory, you could run an OpenBSD box with BGPD, do all the decisions, and then let, let the, the switch 10 terabit backplane do the forwarding, right? It's kind of cheating because the, the flow. Yeah, that's how it works. But now we, we got an, a protocol that, that allows it. I, I usually experiment with, with virtual switches, like OpenV switch or so on the, on, the, on the switch side, but I also have some HP switches that, that support this. So you, you can see it actually on real hardware as well. Then they added IPv6. I don't know why they didn't do IPv6 in the first place. Um, An extensible match, and extensible match is making my life hard because it's, it, it's, allows you to, to have a more sophisticated way of matching packets, but the reference implementation uses macros that generate macros and macros in the C code. It's, it's, it's really terrible, but the company that implemented it, Nisera, I think they got sold for like more than a billion dollars to, to VMware for, for doing macros, right? No. <laughs> And then it goes on and on and on. So you see, like the latest one I could get, there, there are new versions as well, and they're talking about OpenFlow 2 now, but it's, it's, a, it's an open specification, but it's like a little bit like IETF. They're releasing them late, basically. So the latest versions are right here, but you, you can download the standard once they are, I don't know, released for the public. So that's, that's the downside of it. It started well, but now I think maybe there are a thousand pages of specification now or something like that. Um, so I started my experience using the OpenFlow 1.0 protocol around 2013. And when I looked at it, I didn't really want to use the existing controllers, and I want to learn about the protocol. That this was purely for my exercise. The problem is, think about it: you have like a big network, and you have like 1,000 switches, or something like that, or 10,000, or something like this. What I heard yesterday, like things like that. So, and then they're all talking with a central controller, a few servers. Google was one of the early adopters of OpenFlow. They, they switched their global um, backbone to, to these SDN infrastructure. I'm not sure if they're still using it, but they were like among the early adopters. So you have all these 
switches that talk to central servers. And then on these servers, you run like something that is written in, in Java or Python or Ruby, or there's this very early implementation in, in, in C that doesn't have any security um, built in. So that's a very critical point that if it controls all your network and it's a single point of failure, but it's cool and lots of money is going into it, but people just use what's there. Like, I think the most vendors probably use the Java-based versions, like Open Floodlight and then all them. Um, but the, the Python ones are also really big. So there are different implementations and um, yeah, they're, it's sometimes quite complex and horrible and what, what you can do with it. So I thought, well, it would be nice to have a little daemon that uses privilege separation, that is written like an OpenBSD daemon, um, and that implements a minimal subset of it, but enough to do like this layer two switching, and then we see where we can go. I don't, we, we don't need an interface to, for apps or a JSON uh, API or something like this. So, um, yeah, so the, the, I got it working fairly quickly, the initial version, but the, the dragon is in the details. And another problem, I kind of put it on hold and stopped thinking about it. I didn't find a name because OpenFlow is a trademark. The protocol is open, but OpenFlow is a trademark, so I, we couldn't really use OpenFlow D. You know, OpenBSD, we tend to use protocol name D, like BGPD, SMTPD. We, we are not into funny names in OpenBSD. So my idea of using OpenWolf as an anagram of OpenFlow, nobody liked it either. I even had an AirWolf logo of it. And, uh, no. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't have a name. And if you don't find a name for your project, you'll probably stop working on it. OK, now I'm changing the topic. And I will bring it together. And then there's the, the bridge in OpenBSD. That's our kernel bridge driver. I think all the, the bridge was written by uh, Jason Wright, uh, the, Wookie. the Wookie, early OpenBSD developer. Um, I think was our bridge initially also in, in, in the other BSDs and FreeBSD. I don't know. It's, I know they moved away, and the FreeBSD bridge has been changed a long time ago, but there were some similarities. And OK. Yeah. Well, I, I, once, I once ported the rapid spanning tree from FreeBSD, so there must have been similarities. But I, I cannot really remember, actually. So at the moment, we are suffering from the aging bridge code, because there is lots of work in OpenBSD, finally, really, to get the network stack um, MP safe, actually. And we, we there's lots of progress, and the network stack is like partially redesigned. Um, and then the bridge is kind of this, like the single monster in the middle that has the tentacles everywhere. And, and it's not designed for MP safeness, because at this time, there, there was no MP in OpenBSD. OpenBSD was running single processor um, when this bridge was designed. So um, and the bridge is all one, like it's one driver that's, that's doing the bridge cache, so the learning, what we would call the control plane. And we were looking at this, so like, OK, it's kind of in the way. Um, and we cannot really do the, the virtual switching functionality that we want to, that we like <coughs> offload the, the, the decision making, and we have some flow matching in the kernel with the bridge code. So what, what should we do? And then also when Mike Larkin started working on VMM, he said, well, when I'm doing the hypervisor for OpenBSD, the VMM, I need some virtual switch. Otherwise, like, it's not going to be that useful in some cases. And I said, oh, OK, well, I will do it. Um, it was over a, a few beers. So, but he, he reminded me of it when VMM came up, where's your switch, actually? Um, the bridge in OpenBSD has many special features. Well, some of them are normal, like the bridge rules or some blocking features. And um, when I wrote VXLAN, I used, reused the bridge uh, code for the learning of the tunnel destinations, which is, I think it's a very 
nice solution. Others repeated lots of code in, in their implementations, but it also means more dependencies in bridge itself. And the IPsec bridge is maybe an OpenBSD thing, and we, we, we used it for uh, like extending a local bridge over the network over an IPsec tunnel to others, and some quite some heavy setups are using this uh, in Canada as well. So it's integrated, transparent, that there are um, IPsec, uh, either IP tunnels, basically. And then the bridge knows enough to just do what it's supposed to do. And so on. Um, wireless LAN feelover is like another gimmick, and so on. Tentacles everywhere. So we had three possible solutions to, to improve the bridge. Um, like, do what we ever did, improve it incrementally, patch it, clean it up, do some stuff. Uh, we actually split the code a little bit, tried to sort the functions into uh, control and data plane just to have a better idea because it was basically one big file, I have bridge C and then one another file for the spanning tree. And we tried to, to understand it a little bit better. Even developers were looking at the same code and arguing, oh, what's this function supposed to do? Because the code, uh, the data flow was sometimes not very obvious if it's like local traffic or remote traffic and so on. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's lo lots of copying and recycling of Ember. Then um, a, a, um, a Japanese guy, Goda, came up and he ported OpenB switch to OpenBSD. We actually had it working, but you're not getting it. Sorry, we're not releasing this. Um, we saw it was a huge diff because it, in the kernel you need, like for the forwarding plane and, and all the matching and so on, you, you need lots of code. Um, you, you have crazy user land interfaces for it. You have to open up a lot and it just doesn't fit into OpenBSD. And another detail is that by, he reused some parts from Open vSwitch and they're licensed as uh, Apache 2, which is not compatible to the OpenBSD kernel at all. So the third solution is like re-implement it as a new driver. Um, just leave bridge where it is and we add another one, bridge ng, no it's, it's, <laughs> it's switch. Um, everyone calls it switch these days I think. So the problem is if you want to achieve something that OpenB switch does, it's like a lot of work. It's very complex actually. Um, so how can we make it that it's Suites are needs and is simpler. So I had an idea. Why don't we use my experimental OpenFlow controller as a vSwitch and talk to it with OpenFlow from the kernel? So the OpenFlow controller becomes the virtual switch. And I had a name for my implementation. That was the most important part. So this. I just could call it SwitchD. In fact, it's an open flow controller that runs locally and is doing the functionality. Just as a comparison, an open V switch, so I call it the bridge switch, um, you, you, they, they de describe their design. In the kernel, they have their data path, which I said it's quite powerful and fast and all that, but it's, it's a lot of code. Then they have the DPIF, data path interface between kernel and uh, user land. In the user land, they have the OVS vSwitchD and the OVS DB server. And then they have a controller. The controller often or runs on the same host. There's an integrated one or it's, it's on, a, on a remote machine. And we just my idea was, why don't we just skip this part and use OpenFlow as our interface between the kernel and the user land. And it's a device, it's not a socket at the moment. We were thinking about possibilities. It's a device dev switch. Switch zero gets a device dev switch zero. But when you open the socket, it's it's just the OpenFlow protocol. As I said, you can send OpenFlow over different protocols, TCP, UDP, and we, we do it over the device. The nice thing about this is 
you can use the kernel switch driver without using switchd. You can use a simple relay um, that opens up maybe netcat or so. Oh, I'm not sure if netcat works on the device node, but or just cat. <laughs> you just open the dev switch and connect it to another open flow controller that expects like a Unix socket or a TCP socket and so. We tested this. We could use the OVS uh, tools to query the switch, um, the kernel implementation, and it just works. And then, alternatively, you can run your local controller that's SwitchD. SwitchD, of course, knows how to open the device. It can also forward traffic to a remote co controller. In this case, it's just like a relay or a proxy. Or it can do the decisions locally. That really simplified our design. Um, so the switch code is something what, what I had in mind and designed. And so when I talked to Goda again and Yasuoka from Japan, like, okay, why don't you try to implement it this way? And I, I, I guess we can make it much simpler than the OVS part. And then Goda went on a hacking spree and did it. And um, they, they got it working with the OpenFlow 1.0 protocol very fast. Uh, initially, it was done into, in, inside of Bridge. Then we forked it and said, OK, we want to make some incompatible changes to the Bridge code. So we, this is something that turned into a switch. So we have the, the classical interface. We have the control plane, basically. That's like the IO CTL interface and all that. And then we have the open flow implementation in the kernel. It's not small, but it's one file. It's not exactly huge, and it's um, something you can definitely do in the kernel. And then we have a new header for the OpenFlow protocol um, and the devices. Some code is still shared with the bridge code. For example, the spanning tree, there was no need to like copy it. But if we ever decide to get rid of bridge, we could just move it and reuse it. Because the spanning tree is supposed to be done in the forwarding plane in the, in the switch. That is, well, Yasuoka is a little bit blurry here, and that's Goda and me. Uh, it's the uh, N2K15, no, no, the whatever hackathon I have on this t-shirt last year. I, f I forgot the name. It, it was, it was an, uh, yeah, I was a host actually, so it was in, in Hanover. And it was quite nice hackathon there. We basically did most of the work there. Yeah, it was my, probably the most amazing hackathon ever. Yeah, I, I took like 20, maybe 20 OpenBSD developer to the Christmas market. It was around that time. <laughs> and and <laughs> and then we had some 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 users showing up, and we were drinking like um, what's the English word like for Glühwein, like this malted. Well, yeah, so like we got lots of this. And that was quite quite funny, like some German tradition with 20 developers. So. Um, <laughs> when we were back at the hack place, we were singing songs with MPI. <laughs> but I'm not quoting these songs. Anyway, so we have two parts, the switch daemon and the switch configuration. At the moment, the switch daemon configuration file, as I said, that might change quickly, is you have a list on statement where we accept connections from the switches over TCP, so it still works with like any switch that can connect to it. And we have this, like we connect to a device, but then the device internally is, shows up like a, a normal switch. And we can forward it to a remote controller optionally. This the syntax here, this URN like syntax, TCP colon, whatever, something we probably wouldn't use in OpenBSD. But we are thinking about using it because it's part of the open flow standard, you say. You're supposed to express the addresses like this. So I'm not sure how strictly we should follow that. It's kind of weird to have all these colons there. But that's what we do. So what I have in mind is do something more like you define a switch statement in switch decon, then you can have like one or more listen directives, 
and connect direct. You can also connect to, to, to re switches via TCP. Some of them are support that the controller connects to them and sets up the connection. Alternatively, the device, and then optionally, you can forward it to a remote controller. Or if you don't specify that line, you do the learning switch internally. So as always, it's going to be a very simple configuration. Maybe our features will be a little bit limited. So the consideration is like the first part. The second part is like how I change the grammar a little bit. And the switch works really like the, the classical bridge. So you set it up, you add devices. But one difference is in the switch code is um, to actually optimize the data flow in, on most modern implementations, like if, let it be like, I think OpenV switch is doing it like this, or Juniper and so on. You differentiate between like the, the let's say the layer two devices, the forwarding devices. Um, so each device you add, you, you you don't, you cannot add IP addresses on them. In OpenBSD, we have a special situation. If you want to configure an IP address on a bridge, you don't do it on the bridge zero interface. You do it on the on the member interfaces, like EM zero. You add an IP address and add it to the bridge, and then it magically shows up. That's nice from some points of view because it adds more flexibility. But the code path is like causing us problems. So we were thinking about can we make it different in switch that we just add the IP address to switch zero if config switch zero the IP address like everyone else does. And then we had some strong um, arguments about this because it adds problems as well. If you want to down the interface, the IP address the routing, the layer three basically, you have to have config switch zero down to stop the routing, but then the whole switch is down. So it's actually better if you have it independent from each other to avoid this uh, layering problem. So then there's something called IRB. Um, Juniper, I think, also uses this term. It's like the um, interface routing. I don't know. Uh, I, I forgot. So the IRB interface, that's all they call it. That's an, one special type of interface that you can add to the switch. In this interface, you have a different data path, basically, where you can add the, the IP address and so on. So this interface is classically attached more to the control plane and not, not in the fast data path. So it's a slow path. So we, we just reuse VEzer for it. We didn't touch the VEzer code. It's just the switch knows if you add VEzer, OK, that's a special case. When you add it, you can add a IP address to it, add it to the bridge. But when you want to have an IP address on your switch, you're supposed to use VEzer for it. Um, future work. So switch D, as I said, it has to show up in the tree. That's the first important step. Um, I started with OpenFlow 1.0. And as, as I showed you, there are many different versions of it. And we decided, OK, the, the, what's the, the common base, the most important protocol that gives us enough flexibility and that has like wide adoption? It's a 1.3 protocol. Like many vendors implemented in hardware. Um, Open vSwitch, I think, supports it by default uh, these days as well. So there, there are somewhere as at OpenFlow 1.5 and so on. but. The, the adoption is really like this version. And so we, we decided we use this 1.3 version um, and implement everything that must be done, basically, but initially get it initially working. Yeah, support the, the switch context. Um, what we also need to do is allow if multiple switches connect to the same context, merge them into one big virtual switch that's part of the very nice features of it, and we were not quite there yet, but it's, it's not the most important stuff to get it uh, started. And yeah, we do prefab design and switch D by default, but as I said, I did it before pledge showed up. so We have to pledge it to make it secure, and then hopefully we have the first real like secure design of an open flow controller. Mm. Back to the OpenFlow protocol. So SwitchD is at 
1.0, switch for the kernel driver is at 1.3.5 and almost complete the implementation. That's a little problem because now they're not compatible to each other anymore. So we don't know how to solve it yet, but we said, well, we want to stay on 1.3, I think, because it seems to be what we need for a long time. So it, it was my idea to go on 1.3, but I just didn't manage to update SwitchD yet. Once they're updated, they will <laughs> work with each other again. And then hopefully, we don't have to switch anytime soon. Actually, even if the kernel is, stays on an old version, SwitchD could translate later because it's kind of a proxy. And the kernel driver, it needs some cleanup, comment, review. Review is important, that's I also want to release it as open source quickly. Um, there are some nasty mallocs in it that should be replayed with pools because we need to deal with temporary objects a lot. Um, at the moment, switch the only or the switch driver only works if you attach the user land part. But what we want to do is like just if you don't attach to def switch zero, um, then it just defaults to the old behavior. So if you don't run the user land part, it just does the forwarding in the kernel. It's for the moment we can afford it. It's just back and forth. Um, but the implementation of switch is actually not the same as, as the bridge code. Um, and then eventually we remove bridge at some point. It's not easy because the bridge code in OpenBSD, as I said, it has quite some adoption. Um, so if we pull the plug, some people will be dissatisfied. But on the other hand, for um, developer, it's a burden to maintain the bridge code. Yeah, and VXLAN support, there's some improvement that's coming up. We will support IPv6 around this work and all that. And NVGRE, uh, NVGRE is still not supported. Last thing, coming back to Mike Larkin. So we are still working on this VMM as our light wide hypervisor and OpenBSD. So at the moment you attach network interfaces in like the ETC VM and conf by saying interfaces and how many. It's a very simple approach. But this was just meant to be a temporary solution. So my idea was to say, okay, a little bit like in other real hypervisors, you define a virtual machine instead of telling what network interface you want to have, you say, okay, I add an interface in the network VNet1, in the virtual switch, basically. And then in another section, you can define a virtual switch where you add the uplink interfaces or optionally the controller address where to forward this. So I'm not sure how much of this configuration should be done in the VM conf or maybe in the switch D conf. That's not decided yet. But the idea is basically the virtual machine, you configure just the virtual switch where it's attached to. And I think that's the way. Um, Everyone does. So this is coming up. And yeah, VM is slowly moving forward. But um, as I said, like Rome wasn't built in a day. It, we will get there, definitely. It will be done before Vera Airport. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I think they wanted to open it beginning of next year. Oh, they already got that far. OK. <laughs> So, yes, questions. So, this implies that once the thing is either merged in OpenBSD or as a as rolling out of the hypervisor switch to some other open source controller. Yes. And vice versa. Yes. Yeah. 
there are so much possibilities there. It's, it's really like a network developer playground. That's why people love it so much. And yeah, and we, we, we can do that. So the, the one use case, actually attaching an OpenBSD box to a remote controller, that's the one that is more advanced right now because we have the OpenFlow 1.3 in the kernel and then we can just connect it to a controller. That, that's already working, actually. In the virtual environments, it's not the issue anymore. And that's most use cases, maybe. He's speaking from experience, right? <laughs> Well, that's another layer, right? The configuration layer, and then people probably had possibilities to do some whatever open stack or something like this integration there. So thoughts, yes, but this is in, in OpenBSD. We try to provide the tools and in, in, in a clean configuration way. We don't include XML in our base system and all that. That we leave that to the other BSDs, but. Um, Ah, you did it again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely uh, it will be done in, in some way or the other here. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I think, of course, a kernel driver needs needs some some work, right? So it's probably possible to take just the switch OFP part, the OpenFlow protocol itself, and plug it into the FreeBSD bridge somehow, because it's kind of separated. You just have to change the kernel driver to say instead of asking our local forwarding cache, ask this code, and then it takes care to do this. And the daemon. Is, is portable, uh, I mean, like all our networking demons. Of course, maybe you have to disable some things like pledge and so on that are not uh, available on the system, and in theory, our code is um, portable. Like, if you know RelayD, then the switch code, of course, shares lots of code with RelayD because it's, I'm syncing all the time, so. Um, and the real AD runs on FreeBSD. So the kernel part is more complicated, but I think it should be possible because it's designed in such a way that it's not so, not so many tentacles. Like, I'm not sure if you have Open vSwitch in, uh, in FreeBSD, but I've seen it, I think, for NetBSD or maybe just an IHA's version. Um, that's quite some work. So you need some Japanese people who work on this full time <laughs> <laughs> to do it. So anything else? So is there any canon thought or any analysis of the LCSD EBC router and given a really good fast forwarding time? Um, that could drive either EBC users learn to speak OpenFlow or EBC users and switch users learn to speak OpenFlow. Mm. There, there is an there is an implementation on the Linux world. I think they're using Quagga called Flow Visor that's built on this whole monster. So they found a way to do it. But I think if we do it in our way, that the nicest thing would be if we just abstract it away from BGPD. So if we either do it in the kernel, we use, I don't know, just virtual interfaces and then somehow communicate it, or we, we emulate the routing socket or something like that. But the best thing would be if if it's for the daemon, is it transparent? So we could use anything like OSPFT and BGPD, and we, we have a quite advanced MPLS stack in OpenBSD now, like the Brazilians working on it and so on. So 
I don't really want to have a direct connection between the switch and, and, and BGP, actually. But it, that's an implementation detail because the, 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 the way to do it is definitely there. Actually, now this is really just go in the we dreaming something up department, right? Why not do this with PF as well? Inserting a state, not in the kernel, but instead it as a flow in your switchback plane. There's one limitation. Our flows are more, uh, our states are more advanced in, the, in what they're evaluated. So like these extended TCP checks and all that you can probably not do in, in a switchback plane. And you have maybe 10,000 state in a, in a, in a simple, uh, a simple open flow switch like the HP ones, the early ones, they supported 10,000 flows, which is, yeah, for PF we run easily 100,000 in a busy network. Yeah. Um, one option, I suspect that this is what is most easy to do, is is basically having the same thing that you already find in the hardware router, having the fast path in the system plane and the slow path in this case, sending each packet to a, a DMB or yeah. and check it out there. So the simple stuff is is in this. Yes. So So yeah, we get started with it, and we see it's definitely coming. <laughs> it, it was, yeah. I'm not sure what they're making there that makes the standard so large, and the controller software scares you away if you see it and all that. But I think we can get it very useful. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> once again, if you like that, support the OpenBSD project, donations and so on. We we will